face floating toward me. And in my head was this slow, crazy melody, like a tune from another world. And then I saw the room. At first, Queer, mirror all I could see was this face coming inside. towards me. There was danger. There. Then I saw the room. I knew that. A queer I mirror. To turn and run. But I couldn't. It was as if my brain was handled. Then I had to do what I had come to do. And somehow, I was inside it. There was danger there. I knew that. I wanted to turn and run, but I couldn't. It seemed as if my brain was handcuffed, and I had to do what I'd come to do. my will is vanishing. Your will is becoming my will. Slowly but surely. There is no other power but my power over your mind. You are becoming rigid. By the 20th century, hypnosis had been widely discounted in the evolving field of psychoanalysis. It haunted the field as a demonstration of the power of the analyst to act upon the analyzand's unconscious. Hypnotism may well have appeared too densely cloaked in the mystic. It was kept alive in the tradition of stage magic and gradually found its way back into therapeutic treatment, often for now controversial techniques of memory regression. In medicine, it had been used to anesthetize patients, but in stage shows, it was more commonly used to demonstrate suggestibility, to trick the subject into a performance or a belief, to cast a sensation using only the calmed imagination. Sit down. Relax. Because hypnosis has the dual heritage of being a legitimate course of medical treatment and inquiry, and a popular stage trick, because it can probe the mind in a manner that naturally confuses the imagination and the memory, it is an ideal bedfellow for the esoteric frights of Pulp Fiction. Tell you. 
Cornell Woolrich, one of the major voices in 20th century crime fiction, drew from hypnosis in his 1941 story, And So to Death. The story would be adapted for the screen twice, both times by filmmaker Maxwell Shane. In 1947 as Fear in the Night, and in 1956 as Nightmare. In Shane's adaptations, a young man is haunted by a nightmare in which he commits a murder in a mirrored room, surrounded by reflections of himself committing the crime. In Fear in the Night, the man is a bank teller with an on-again, off-again girlfriend, on the cusp of assuming adult responsibilities, but boyish enough to suggest helplessness and naivety. The dream, the struggle, the murder, everything, but how? Could something like that happen and I not know it? Was I going insane? A jackhammer started pounding inside my head. I had to see if the outside world was still there. The street below looked the same as it did last night. The same greasy spoon where I eat now and then. The same traffic noises. The same characters lounging around. There was nothing the matter out there. It was in here with me. My stomach was riding a roller coaster. I was sick. I couldn't face going to work. In Nightmare, he's a jazz musician, square in temperament, fully mature. The dream, the struggle, the murder, everything. Was I going insane? Across the rooftops, I could see the river. Out there, everything was status quo. The hassle was in here, with me. My stomach was riding a roller coaster. I couldn't face going to work. I didn't want to see anybody. In both versions, he lives in a hotel. His nightmare leads him to seek counsel from his brother-in-law, a policeman, who initially dismisses his story until evidence supporting his account turns up. The two of them find the mirrored room in a house where a murder has recently occurred, discovered seemingly by chance while seeking shelter with their dates during a couple's picnic. The two set out to unravel how a nightmare can bleed into waking life, how an unwilling man can commit a murder seemingly in his sleep. By the climax, they have uncovered a conspiracy in which the young man has been set up by a mesmerist living in the next room, who has hypnotized him into performing the crime for his own reasons, using the protagonist as a golem to murder the mesmerist's wife and her lover. Shane's reasons for remaking his own film less than a decade after its release remain mysterious, but it's possible that he did so simply because opportunity allowed him to. The material is not explored in a new way beyond the change of the protagonist's occupation and a change of setting from New York to New Orleans. Despite its embrace of the hipster culture of New Orleans jazz, Nightmare is distinctively less adventurous in its styling than Fear in the Night, which features techniques of superimposition, starker lighting, restless camera work, and a variety of illusions. 
by comparison, Nightmare is a conventional film. Even when its hallucinatory sequences are closely patterned on the earlier film, it remains aesthetically closer to the stylistic expectations of television. The strength of Fear in the Night over Nightmare is a testament to the scrappy and wild dimensions of 1940s B-picture productions. The studio pedigree of Nightmare stiffens the material, granting it a smooth, clean execution. By comparison, the menacing camera work and urgent performances of Fear in the Night give the film a more distinctive, threatening, unpredictable atmosphere. Despite their similarities, Fear in the Night more strongly suggests a nightmare in its optical distortions, its uneven highlights, and stylized shadows. Thomas Renzi identifies the subtext of queer anxiety and homoeroticism that runs through Fear in the Night. The mesmerist's psychic violation of the young bachelor creates a trap of seemingly unresolvable guilt and pain, a wild, escalating temperament, and a melancholy disinterest in love. Nightmare abandons these themes by suggesting its protagonist is a confident, sexually mature adult whose primary frustration in life is the old-fashioned music he's asked to play in clubs. His anxieties are thus more focused on resolving a mystery than exploring his own potential guilt, or his trauma at losing his agency and being violated through hypnotism. This protagonist can confidently proceed knowing a dirty trick is being played on him, while in Fear in the Night, the young bachelor is filled with doubts about himself, his memory, his experiences. He becomes more reliant on his older, more experienced, married brother-in-law. Fear in the Night presents a world in which men are cuckolded, murderous, the violators and the violated. And women are either loving and devoted non-players, or they are victims, a beautiful face screaming from a dream. In Nightmare, the men are less archetypal, less symbolic, and the women more decisive and sexually empowered. Shane's act of remaking his own film presents a curious parallel to elements of the story itself in that this story concerns the faults of memory and repetition and reflections. It rejects psychotherapy while acknowledging the mysterious corridors of a troubled mind. It offers practical solutions to profound psychic traumas. Both films feature these mirrored chambers, where the mirror reflects, but also bifurcates, doubles, and haunts the dreamers. 
The Mirror is a perfect metaphor for Shane's remaking of his film, as he uses the same script, the same shot types, building the remake as an uncanny experience. Shane's films also draw from some of the earliest precedents of horror filmmaking. The image of the puppet who acts under the influence of a wise man. Césaire the Somnambulist in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Rabbi Lowe's Golem in The Golem. Where those puppets have always represented a pure neutrality, the protagonists of Shane's films are definitively presented as good men who have been deprived of free will. I killed that man in self-defense, but now I'll never be able to clear myself in the eyes of the law, and you're going to pay for doing that to me. Wait, don't do that. Alive, maybe I can do something for you. I'll give you money, I'll get you out of the country. No one will know. My conscience will know. I've got an honest man's conscience in a murderer's body. You should have let me alone, Belknap. That was your mistake. Wait, one minute. Give me one minute to make you see. Just 60 seconds. You don't want to kill me. Those two were plotting against me for months. I knew it. That's why I planned the whole thing. I had to do it. Don't you understand? You can understand that. Stop it, Belknap. Just a few seconds, please. You don't want to kill me. Look up. Look up, please. See? Just 30 seconds. And I'm sure I can make you understand. Just a few seconds. The dreamer's conscience is cleared by exposing the conspiracy. Much is done in both films to establish the visceral, physical manifestations of his guilt his restlessness, his hauntedness. In Fear in the Night, his absolution upon being rescued offers a conventional happy ending, where he and his brother-in-law meet his sister and his girlfriend outside the courthouse, and the puppet, now freed, can enter adulthood as a man. Nightmare cleans up the case in an even more tidy way. The mesmerist is killed by the police, and the protagonist resumes his life as a successful jazz musician. He's even granted an opportunity to play the more progressive, modern jazz that his bandmates had previously found objectionable. The young man's liberation is unconditional. Left lingering is the idea that an ordinary person can be transformed into an instrument for murder. That threat remains present in the film's themes. Loss of autonomy and free will, suggestibility, the sublimation of desire, and the ambiguity between the memory of an experience and the memory of a dream.